In this experiment, we are going to look at a streak plate to streak for isolation of bacteria, and this is activity 1-4. So the purpose of the streak plate is to isolate individual colonies of bacteria from a large mixed population. So let's say, for example, that we wanted to look at different types of bacteria that was found in soil. And so if we were to look at soil, are we going to find just one type of bacteria? And the answer is no, right? There's likely going to be a mixture of bacteria. So what we would need to do first is to isolate the individual types of bacteria, meaning to separate them out, so then we could study the individual bacteria. Because what you're looking at is each colony of bacteria was one bacterium that divided asexually, and gave rise to many cells, in many cases millions of cells, which then resulted in a colony. So each of these colonies of bacteria are derived from one individual bacterial cell. And so this technique is going to isolate individual types of bacteria from a large mixed population. When we do this experiment, we use a tube, a glass tube, that contains about one centimeters of liquid. And so in these tubes, one centimeter of liquid is approximately one milliliter of a bacterial stock. When we do our first streak plate, our first streak plate is going to be a mixture of red and white bacteria so that we can actually see if we can isolate the two types, meaning do we get some colonies that are red and some colonies that are white. The broth itself, the original culture, is cloudy which tells us that bacteria is growing in here. When we refer to a broth as being cloudy, we call that being turbid, and turbidity indicates growth. And in order to see that turbidity, the bacteria is over a million within that culture. Now, when we do our streak plate, we do what's called a quadrant streak plate. The plate is divided up into four quadrants. So we have quadrant one, two, three, and four. And so notice something interesting about these different quadrants. What you'll notice is, is that quadrant number one has the most bacteria in it. Quadrant number two has a little bit less. Quadrant number three has even less. And by the time we get out to quadrant number four, we now have our isolated individual colonies. And so one of the goals in doing a streak plate is that for each of those subsequent uh, quadrants, we want to get less and less and less bacteria until eventually we get isolated colonies. Now, when we're trying to determine if a streak plate is successful, if we look at this plate, we do have isolation in quadrant four, right? There are a few little colonies in quadrant three that are isolated, but most of our isolation happened in quadrant four. What I wanna make sure to point out is the isolation does not have to happen in quadrant four, for it to be successful. In some cases, you might see isolation in quadrant three, meaning you have less bacteria in quadrant three, and then quadrant four has nothing. In that case, that is still considered a successful streak plate because you still got isolation and you were able to isolate different types of bacteria. So it doesn't matter which quadrant has isolation, as long as you have isolation, then we would call this a successful streak plate. And so let's talk about how do we make a plate that gets less and less and less colonies in each quadrant. So what we would do for this, and I have a video demonstrating this in a minute. So we would have our auger plate, and remember that we always label the plate on the auger side of the plate, right? So we don't label the lid because if the lid were to fall off, then we don't know what's on the plate. So we would always label on the auger side of our plate and we would label along the edge. So my plate would say streak plate number one, my name, so my initials, and then the class period that I was a part of. And usually I would also indicate my date, the date of the experiment. And so again, we write this along the edge of the plate. Now, when we do this experiment, we want to keep our plate auger side up as much as possible we want the lid to be on the bottom. And the reason for that is, is that when we look at these plates, you'll notice that there's condensation in the bottom. There's water often in the lid. 
if we flip our plate over and we put it auger side down and we let it sit for a long period of time, all that water that was in the lid ends up on the auger. And if the auger is really moist and really wet, it's gonna cause the bacteria to smear and you're not gonna get isolation. And so it's important when we do this experiment that we keep our plate auger side up for as long as possible. But when we're ready to do our streak plate, then we turn it over so that the auger side is down because we have to do our streaking on the auger. If we streak the lid, nothing's gonna grow. So we have to streak the auger. So right before we start, we would turn the plate over and we would put auger side down. Now, when we do our streak plate technique, just like for any other aseptic technique, again, good rules of thumb, don't stand right over your plate, right? We don't want to have our plate right underneath us so that things fall on it. We want to work with our plate out in front of us and we wanna streak our plate by the flame because again, the flame is gonna be our sterile area. The other thing is, is that we don't wanna take the lid all the way off when we're working with our plate. We don't wanna take the lid off and set it down. We are gonna do what's called a clamshell technique. And that means that you're just gonna open the lid a little bit, just enough to get your loop in there, but you're not going to take the lid all the way off and you're not gonna set the lid down because doing so would allow contamination possibly to end up on your plate. So those are just some general kind of aseptic techniques. Now, how do we get less and less quadrant or less bacteria in each quadrant? So what we would do is we would have our liquid culture and to start, we would vortex. Vortex basically means to mix the bacteria. In the video, I will show you how to do that. You're going to push with your finger to make the tube vortex. We do have electronic vortex machines. We use those for certain experiments, but for day-to-day -day vortexing, we often just do it by hand. We don't use a machine. We don't wanna flick it with our nail. We don't wanna flick the tube with our nail because it, there's a possibility of when you flick it that you might lose control of the tube that you're trying to flick, which would cause your broth to go everywhere. So we don't do that. We make sure that we vortex with our fingers. And again, you're gonna see this when I show you the video demonstrating this technique. So it's really important when you start that you vortex, you mix that bacteria really well. Because what happens is, is when the bacteria sits in the broth, the bacteria likes to settle to the bottom. So if you don't mix the broth, the bacteria is gonna be in the bottom. And if you dip your loop in, it's not going to pick up the bacteria. So we have to make sure that we really vortex well to mix that tube before we introduce our loop into that culture. So the way that this technique is going to work, and again, you're gonna see this in a minute in the video, but you would turn on your Bunsen burner and make sure that you have your inner blue cone. Remember that that's the hottest part of your flame. So you need to get your Bunsen burner on. It needs to have the blue flame. Now you're gonna take your loop, and just like we talked about in the aseptic technique, holding your loop like a pencil, you're going to flame your loop starting at the base and working towards the tip. Now, do I want to stick my loop directly in that hot broth or directly in the broth while it's hot? Answer is no. If I take that red hot loop and I stick it directly in the broth, I'm gonna kill the bacteria. It's gonna make the solution too hot. So it's really important that after you flame your loop, just like for our aseptic technique, you need to hold the loop close to the flame and you wanna let it cool. Now you don't wanna fling your loop to try and cool it. You don't wanna like shake your loop to try and get it to cool faster. Don't do that, that, that would have a risk for contamination. You would just hold your loop next to the flame and let it cool. Now, while your loop is cooling, you're going to vortex with your finger to mix your tube. You're gonna take your tube with your broth and you're gonna hold it in your non-loop hand and then using the hand with your loop, remember that's how we remove the cap. We take the cap between our pinky and our ring finger. We take the cap off the broth 
We pass the opening of the tube through the flame to sterilize the rim. And then we're going to um, put our loop into that broth, right? Because we wanna pick up bacteria on the loop. Now, when we dip a loop into liquid culture, into a broth, there's a lot of liquid. So you wanna make sure that you are very careful when you remove the loop and that you keep that hand as steady as possible. Because if there's liquid in the middle of the loop and you're shaking your hand, that broth is gonna end up on the countertop, which you don't want to happen. So it's really important when you're working with a loop and you're working with a liquid culture that you keep your loop hand as steady as possible. So when I take my loop out of the broth, I'm gonna take the tube with the broth and I'm again gonna flame it and then I'm gonna put the cap on. I'm done with the broth after that. I only go into the broth one time. And so what I'm gonna do is after I pick up my broth and it's on my loop, I'm gonna draw one line down. And notice that that line down, this occupies about a quarter of the plate, a quarter to about a third of the plate. So I draw one line down with my loop and then I take my loop and I go side to side, side to side, back and forth, back and forth, and I just wanna fill in this entire area. I wanna create what's called a lawn. I want that area so filled in that I don't see any individual colonies. It's just a lawn of bacteria. It's just a big mat of bacteria in that quadrant. So one line down and then side to side, side to side, zigzag back and forth, going up and then down and then back up and then down. So once I do that, once I put my bacteria on my first quadrant, remember that the goal is to get less bacteria in each quadrant. So to get less bacteria in each quadrant, I need to flame my loop. So I flame my loop and I let it cool. While I do that, I rotate my plate 90 degrees so that now when I'm doing this, this first quadrant is over here when I do this. And when I do that, then I can do, after my loop has cooled, I can do my six to eight directional streaks. And what that means is they're not zigzag streaks. They're simply just, I take my loop and I pull out from quadrant one, meaning I touch in where the bacteria would be in quadrant one and I draw my line out. I pick up my loop and I draw my line out. Now, it's important that you give yourself enough space between these quadrants. You don't want those lines overlapping, you don't want those lines touching, because if they are, you have to remember you're gonna end up with bacteria wherever these lines are. If your lines are too close together, those colonies are gonna to touch and you're not gonna get isolation. So it's really important that when you do these directional streaks, that you basically wanna make sure that you leave a gap. Now, the other important thing about these streaks is the angle of your loop. You want your loop, if this is the auger, you want your loop to be you know, about 45, maybe a little less in terms of degrees from the plate. I don't wanna to be too vertical. I don't wanna be straight up and down while I'm trying to do my streaks. If I do that, I'm gonna to put too much pressure on the auger and the auger's gonna tear. I also don't wanna to be too flat. And so notice that if I'm too flat, then the sides of the loops are touching as well. And what ends up happening is, is when you're too flat, your streaks end up really broad because instead of just being along the one edge, the one part that's touching, when you're flat, you have that whole circle going across. So you end up with these really fat, broad streaks and you're not gonna get isolation. So one of the biggest things in terms of streak plate for students to get this technique right, technique right is the biggest things that I notice is that students often are too flat, meaning their loop is too flat and they end up with broad streaks and that ends up not having isolation or that they don't leave enough space between their directional streaks. So it's really important that you do these lines, these directional streaks with your loop at about a 45 degree angle, maybe a little bit less than that. You don't want your loop to be too flat.
So you're going to take your loop and you're going to do your directional streaks. And you're going to do about six to eight. Now, if you leave a lot of space between these, you might only be able to fit in five. If that's the case, if you do like five of those directional streaks and you're already a third of the way down your plate, don't try and fit in six or seven. Just leave it at five. It's better to have too much space than not enough. So you want to make sure that you leave yourself space. If you can't fit six or you can't fit eight streaks in, that's not the end of the world. Leave it be. So you're going to do your directional streaks in quadrant number two. Then you're going to rotate your plate 90 degrees. So now that original quadrant, which was over here, is now going to be down here. Now your lines are going to go from your second quadrant to your third. But before you do that, you need to make sure to flame your loop. So in between going from quadrant one to two, you have to flame your loop, right? You want to get less bacteria. So you draw out your lines to do quadrant two. Going from quadrant two to quadrant three, you need to flame your loop because you want to get even less bacteria in quadrant number three. So you flame your loop, you let it cool. Again, you're going to repeat with your six to eight directional streaks. So again, pull from the second quadrant out, pull from the second quadrant out. You want about six to eight of those directional streaks. Now, once you do these directional streaks, again, you're going to rotate your plate 90 degrees. And in quadrant number four, you are not going to flame your loop between quadrant three and four. This is the one time you don't flame your loop. And the reason is, is if you flame your loop after quadrant three, and then you go to do quadrant four, you're not going to pick up enough bacteria. So don't flame your loop between quadrants three and four. So when you do quadrant three, or when you go from quadrant three to four, you're going to draw your line out. You're going to go back into quadrant three. You're going to go back out, go back into quadrant three, and then zigzag into the open space, but making sure not to hit quadrant one or two. It's really important that quadrant four not hit any of these earlier quadrants. We don't want to pull the bacteria back out from quadrant one into quadrant four, because again, remember that quadrant one is going to have the most bacteria. The goal is for each quadrant, we want to get less and less bacteria. So quadrant four, we need to make sure that we don't hit any of the earlier quadrants. So we zigzag into the open space. Now, couple other keys. In between steps, if you're trying to cool your loop down um, during this experiment, what you can do is you can take your loop and you can touch it to a part of the auger where there's no bacteria yet. That helps to cool down the loop without touching any bacteria. So that's a little trick that we can do. The other thing is, again, you wanna keep in mind if you were doing this, that you only go into the broth once. Once you're done with that broth, you need to put it aside and not go back in it. Because if I were to dip back in my broth after quadrant one, and I dip my loop back in quadrant, or dip my loop back in the broth, and then do my streaks for quadrant two, I'm not gonna end up with less bacteria in quadrant two. So it's really important that we only go into the broth one time. After we go into the broth, we're gonna put the broth aside and we're not gonna touch it anymore because the goal is to get less and less and less bacteria in each of the four quadrants until we have isolation. And so now let me show you the video demonstrating this technique. So when we start, we have our Bunsen burner lit and notice that it has a blue inner cone, the hottest part of the flame. I'm working with my plate close to the flame because that's the sterile field. And I'm going to flame my loop starting with the base and working towards the loop itself. Notice that I have my plate auger side up to start because I want to keep the condensation on the bottom. There is a little line on the top of the plate and I use that to help guide myself that that, was, that would be where quadrant one is. So when I'm ready, I flip my plate over so that it's auger side down. 
Now I pick up the tube with the, with the broth in it that has the bacteria and I'm vortexing with my finger. Notice I'm not flicking with my nail. I'm just vortexing. And I'm trying to mix the bacteria so that it's not all settled at the bottom. I take the cap between my pinky and my ring finger. Remember, I don't set the cap down. I flame the opening of the broth. And I take my loop that's cooled and I stick it inside. I'm careful to keep the broth stable, flame the tube, put it down. Now I have liquid culture on my loop. And so I'm gonna go one line down and I'm gonna go side to side, side to side, and I'm gonna fill that in. Now normally I keep the plate more closed, I keep it more covered, but I moved it off to the side just for demonstration purposes so that you could see what I was doing with my loop. So I just filled in quadrant one, and now I'm going to flame my loop, starting with the base, and working towards the tip. While that's cooling, you're gonna see me rotate my plate 90 degrees. That line, the quadrant one, is on the top right now. I'm gonna rotate it so that the line now is facing the Bunsen burner. And so quadrant number one is over to the right, and I'm gonna streak going across the top. While my loop is cooling, I want to point out that when I do my streaks, I always go side to side. I never pull the loop towards me or push it. I always do my streaks side to side. So my loop is cooling. Now I can start to do my streaks. I'm touching the loop to the auger to make sure that it's not too hot. And then I'm gonna do my six to eight directional streaks. So I'm going to hold my loop at a 45 degree angle and I'm going to drag the loop out approximately six to eight times. Then I'm going to flame my loop because again, I wanna get even less bacteria in quadrant number three. So I flame from the base working towards the loop and I let it cool. While I let it cool, again, I'm gonna rotate 90 degrees. So now quadrant one is at the bottom. Quadrant number two is towards the Bunsen burner. And so quadrant number three is gonna go out from there. Again, going from left to right. It's easier to go left to right, just like you would write if you were writing on a paper. So I'm just holding my loop, letting it cool. I'm going to touch it to a part of my plate that the bacteria is not. And I'm going to make sure that it's not too hot. So now I'm doing my six to eight directional streaks, pulling from quadrant two out. And again, notice I'm at about a 45 degree angle because I don't want my loop to be too flat. Between quadrant three and four, remember that we don't flame the loop. So I'm just gonna go from quadrant three, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna go back in, and then I'm gonna zigzag into the open space, making sure not to touch any of the other streaks. And then I'm gonna flame my loop, starting from the base, working towards the tip, before I set that loop down, because it has bacteria on it, and I don't wanna set it down until I kill the bacteria. Once I'm finished with my plate, I will turn it auger side up and I will place it in a 37 degree incubator to allow it to grow. So now we're gonna look at what it would look like after it had incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. So day two would be when we come back for the next class period when we check our plate. And normally what we would do in lab is we actually would have two attempts at a streak plate. You would do it once, we would look at your plates and I would actually come around to each student and I would give you feedback on your particular streak plate. And then from there, I would give you directions on what you could do better for the second plate and then you would attempt it again. So let's look at what those plates would look like. So when you look at a streak plate, you wanna see, do you see isolation? So remember that for our plate, that our plate basically is gonna have four quadrants. 
And remember that our broth is a mixture of red and white bacteria. So what we're trying to see is, do we have isolated red and white colonies? If we do, we have a successful streak plate. So notice that for both of these examples, these are both good examples of streaking for isolation because we have isolated both white and red colonies. So notice here's a good white one, here's another white one, here's another white one, here's a red colony by itself, here's a red colony by itself. There are a lot of colonies that could be used on this plate. Same thing on this plate. So notice the technique is a little bit different for how they did their quadrant streaks. One of the things that you'll learn is that people do their quadrant streaks a little bit different, but they ultimately can get the same result. So this plate over here is more similar to what we actually do, which is that we have our lawn for quadrant one, and then we have our directional streaks, and then we have our isolated colonies. This plate looks a little bit different, so instead of having the directional streaks, we have more of this kind of zigzag pattern that they use to streak for isolation. But notice that both plates ultimately get you to the same goal, which is isolated red and white colonies. And so this is just a different example. So here's a red colony isolated, here's a white one, here's a red one. You can see that there's lots of different colonies that you can choose from where you see isolation. And so this, both of those plates would be examples of successful streak plates. If I were looking at this plate, my only suggestion would be that these streaks got close together. And also the one thing you can see is that these streaks look a little bit broad. So what that means is it's likely that somebody who was doing this plate, that their loop angle was a little bit too flat and that loop angle being flat gives you broad streaks you want your streaks to be a lot thinner. So this plate has more of the kind of thinner streaks. Notice that you don't see these like broad streaks in here, whereas this one has a little bit more of the broad streaks going on. But notice that for both of these plates, these would be considered successful streak plates because you have successfully isolated both red and white colonies. This would be an example of a bad plate. So notice that quadrant one and two have a ton of bacteria. So it's possible maybe that the person who did this, maybe they went back into their broth again before quadrant two. They also have very, very broad strokes. So you can notice like the, the width across here, this is a very broad streak, which means that the loop was too flat. So that it's the entire diameter of the loop that you're seeing versus nice thin streaks. And so in this plate, you don't have any isolation. And so this would be considered a bad streak plate. Now it does not matter that we don't have bacteria in the last quadrant. Again, that does not indicate whether the technique is successful or not. What tells us if the technique is successful is if we have isolation. If we have isolated red and white colonies, it doesn't matter which quadrant we see that isolation. As long as we have isolation, we would call that a successful streak plate. And so this is not that because we don't have any isolated colonies. So this would be a bad example of a streak plate. So in class, you guys would repeat this experiment and we would make it a little bit more difficult on you. And in your second streak plate, you would have a mixture of white, yellow, and red bacteria. So now you would have to separate three different types of bacteria to get isolation. So I would give you a couple reminders for your streak plate. Don't place the lid on the table. So you wouldn't wanna take the lid all the way off and set it down. You wanna hold it like a clamshell. Again, in the video, I took it off a little more than I normally would. And that was mainly so that you could see what I was doing on the plate but normally I would keep the lid covering even more. Don't put your face over the plate. Again, you wanna work out in front of you and you want to make sure that you're working by the flame because the flame again is your sterile area. And so you wanna make sure that you're not contaminating your plate. So you don't want to put your plate right underneath where you're working. You don't wanna double dip, meaning stick the loop back into the broth after the first quadrant. Because again, the goal is to get less and less and less bacteria in each quadrant. So we only go into the broth once 
for quadrant number one. And after we go into the broth for quadrant number one, we would flame our loop and then go directly to quadrant two. We don't go back into the broth because if we go back into the broth, we're gonna pick up too much liquid or we're gonna pick up too much bacteria. So we only go into the broth once. Don't double dip, don't go back into the broth to get more bacteria for subsequent quadrants. Don't go back into your quadrants again for the last set of streaks. So again, for quadrant number four, I wanna make sure that I don't accidentally hit quadrant number one and then draw our lines out. I wanna make sure that quadrant number four is only pulled out from quadrant three and that's it. I don't wanna to touch quadrant one or two because that will pull out all that bacteria and then you might not get isolation. Don't flame your loop for the fourth quadrant. So when you go between quadrant three and four, you're not gonna flame your loop. You're just gonna simply rotate your plate and then you're gonna draw your line out, back in, out, and then zigzag going down. So again, you don't wanna flame between quadrant three and four or you won't have enough bacteria. And then don't leave your lid open for long periods of time. Again, you would only open it when you're ready to do your streaks and then you would close it right away. And again, another thing to keep in mind is when you're not working with your plate, you always want it to be auger side up. You only flip it to auger side down, meaning the auger's on the bottom, when you're ready to do your streaks. And immediately after you're done, you need to flip that plate over to auger side up so that the condensation doesn't sit on the auger. So this would be just a reminder on how to do your streak plate. So again, this you've already seen, but this is what we would repeat for a second streak plate. And then we would look at our second streak plate and see if we see isolated white and yellow and red colonies. And if we did, we would have a successful streak plate. And so this is how we streak for isolation. This is how we isolate bacteria from a large mixed culture. This is our technique to isolate individual bacteria.